Welcome back to our study in the book of Colossians. We are already to chapter 4, and in this chapter, uh, which is the last one, uh, we've subtitled this uh, Checklists for the Church. In fact, there are two of them. Here, is, here are the maps that we have been looking at, and you can see Colossians notated and underlined uh, the city of Colossae in red. This gives you a little better view. Uh, it's in larger print, of course, basically in the center. You can see some of the trade routes that came near and intersected at Laodicea and then worked its way all the way over to Ephesus. This is a little bit better. And from Colossae to Ephesus was 120 miles. So if you had a car, you might make it in two hours. Some of it's through the mountains. Probably not, but you could get there in a day. Uh, you couldn't walk that in a day. And concerning Paul's writings, uh, the letter that was written was written from jail in Rome, and it made its way all the way uh, to uh, Colossae via sea and messenger and the pastor of the church. Okay, here's a riddle question for you. What is the town of Colossae's favorite bird? Okay, you ready? Uh, the town of Colossae's favorite bird? It's the Colostrich. So, I'll let you think about that for a while. Let's go on to some serious things. Uh, here we are, what is in uh, yellow is where we are in the outline. And we're going to get right into scripture. Uh, it's all about checklist, and it's like a, a recap. It's the Apostle Paul coming back and highlighting some of the, the important things um, that he just wanted to emphasize that much more. And the very first one is sort of an, ex, an, extenua, uh, an extension of the last chapter as he's dealing with masters and slaves. We would look at it today as we don't have slavery in America, although much of the world is in slavery. Uh, we would have bosses and workers. We would have people over us and people under us. And so what's the relationships of that? So let's read, if I may. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This is a wonderful principle. Um, I've been the boss of people. I guess I still am, but I'm under people right now. And if you are a leader or if you're a boss, uh, even if you're a dad in the home, um, notice I highlighted the word give. So it's not take, it's not demand of your servants that if we, the, the determining factor of a good boss is how much are you willing to give? and give unto your servants. So masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So give fair pay, give fair time, give equal, and uh, just be honest and loving and giving and caring. Okay, now we read on and let's go on to the next one. Here's the checklist on number one, treat workers fairly. Just treat workers fairly, honestly, and uh, equally. And so we put that on the checklist. Number two, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. All right, so now we're over into, into a different arena. Remember, these are recaps, so verses are going to change. A couple of them will be... A couple of verses will be the same thing. But here we have two. One is continue in prayer or keep praying and watch or stay awake in the same with thanksgiving. So what do you, what are we what are we to continue in prayer? What pray for one another. Paul was asking for prayer for himself. Pray for our church, pray for our nation, pray for the needs of others. Pray for our hearts. In our lives, just keep praying. 
And then watch, stay awake, don't fall asleep, and be thankful for the things that God has blessed you with. So the watch carries with it an expectancy. The word watch in the Greek means you keep praying and keep praying and praying, praying, and expect God to do something and have thanksgiving in your heart. With all praying also, so here's some of the things I already said, with all praying also for us, and literally in the Greek it reads this way, praying at the same time also for us. So as you're praying for others, don't forget to pray for us. And you know, as you pray for others, don't forget to pray for us whoever that is in your life, or what other group of people that might be, that God would open unto us a door of utterance or opportunity. That's a good prayer. We should be praying that God would open doors of opportunity for us every day to be a witness to him and a servant to him. And why are they praying and why are they wanting an, an opportunity uh, to the, here it is, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I'm also in bonds. Paul's saying I'm in jail and I'm in chains. But the mystery, what is the mystery of Christ? We've already looked at that. And uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But here it is, pray specifically. Pray by name, pray by need, pray by an event. And number two, have expectancy. Expect God to work. Expect to see God at work in your life today. Look for it. Pray for it. Expect it. Now, here's what Colossians 1, and 27 said, because it explained the mystery of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory in this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope and glory. That's the mystery. And we are to share that. We are to pray for opportunities to share that mystery, to share that testimony for the Lord, to, to expect God to do something with the words that we, that we, that we speak. Now, verse 4, that I, may, that I may make it manifest or make it very clear as I ought to speak. So he's saying, pray not only for an open door, but pray that, I, that I'm understandable, that I keep it simple, that I keep it clear. And so that goes on to the, our spiritual checklist of wrap-up things. See, Paul says, when you have opportunity to speak, pray God helps you to speak clearly so that people in the world understand what you're saying. Verse 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. So walk is talking about conduct our life, conduct our life as, as a Christian. And without are non-Christians or people outside the faith, without, outside the faith. Redeeming always means make the most of our time, redeeming the time when it talks about that. Make the most of our time. And time is, once again, time or opportunity. It's denoting space of time to be filled with all kinds of possibilities. But time, the space that we have, we're praying, Lord, may we fill it with opportunities to share Christ and to walk in wisdom so that people look at us in a way and that they know we're Christians, that they know we're different. So on to our checklist, we have walk in wisdom. And I put that as to say, in front of the lost, be a testimony as you walk in your world today. And number whatever it is, 246, manage your time. Manage our time. Take, redeem the time that we live in. You know, Paul said, redeeming the time for the days are evil. And they are. And so Paul's final challenge to this church is coming up. He's basically saying in a lot of things that are on this list, be wise in dealing with the lost. And here's the last verse in this section. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt is talking about being, don't be 
stiff in your speaking. Have It literally means witty sayings or sparkling conversation. Have passion. So when you speak, it's just not... It's not like you're reading something or that you're uttering something you've memorized and you have no inflection, you have no life in your, in your voice and what you're saying. Have, pray for passion and for witty sayings that helps open the door that adds flavor to your speech, that people listen to that and that they do not lose attention. And so that's the last thing I put was speak with passion. If you speak with passion, we generally speak understandably and we keep people's attention because they don't know how we're going to speak next. All right, now we go into the next section, a checklist of those to rem be remembered. And these verses could go fast, but what I've done, are these are the names of the people. These are members of the church. These are people that love the Lord and are serving God. And the, and the book wraps up with, with this list and with these individuals. In all my state and all things related to me shall Tychicus declare unto you. So Tychicus is, is, has come from prison to deliver the letter. And he says, he'll catch you up on how I am. Who he is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord. Think of that about this individual. So what do we know about Tychicus? Uh, he's a Christian in Asia Minor. He traveled in advance of Paul as well as with him at times. We read that in Acts 20 verse 4. So he was an advanced man, but he also traveled with him. He prepared people for Paul to, re to come or surveyed out a city. Paul sent him to Ephesus where he delivered and likely read the circular letter, the epistle to the Ephesians, to the church there. Then he went to Colossae and did the same with the Colossians. We'll read that shortly. He also had a mission to fulfill in Crete. Paul speaks of him in affectionate terms, quote, a brother, beloved, and faithful minister of the Lord, quote, and unable and able to, quote, comfort your hearts, unquote. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate or how you are, and comfort your hearts, encourage you. So that was Tychicus, and, and he's in that church. Then there's Onesimus, a faith with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Once again, they'll fill you in on what's going on. And who was Onesimus? He was a youthful slave who, after robbing his master Philemon in this church, and Colossae. He ran to Rome, ran across the Apostle Paul somewhere along the way, and Paul led him to the Lord, and he sent him back with Tychicus with a letter to Philemon, and that is the, the name of the book of the Bible, Philemon, and that's a letter all about take your say slave that ran away back because he will be extremely profitable to you, to you because he's a child of God. Ask him. And he sent him to the back to his master. And uh, in it, he begs Philemon to receive him as a, quote, faithful and beloved brother, unquote. Paul also offers to pay back Philemon anything Onesimus had taken from him or any wrong he'd done. And he came back to Colossae with Tychicus, as I've already said. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner or prisoner of war, Salute you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. Now, who are these two individuals? Aristarchus was a ruler and a native of Thessalonica. We read a lot of this in Acts, and I've given you all these references. And he was a, once again a companion of the Apostle Paul. He was Paul's, quote, fellow prisoner at Rome. So he was in jail with him. And Marcus, this is John Mark. And right now, this is, a, this is the good Mark. He deserted Paul and in the book of Acts and was previously rejected by him for service. He just didn't want him. 
Later, Paul deemed him profitable for the ministry and wanted him back in. And so this is a profitable Mark or Marcus. And Jesus, who is called Justice, here's another member, who are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort to me or encouraged me. And so here's a man named Justice, and he had the ministry or he had the ability to encourage the Apostle Paul. He would speak to him and comfort him in, in times of woe and hurt and wrong, but he'd lift his spirits. And we have people like that in our church that are people of comfort and encouragers. You that have that gift, you that do that, do not stop using it. You are needed for the work of God. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Well, here's Epaphras, and we've heard this name before. Laboring means she struggles fervent, struggles and agonizes in prayer over the church, and the people there. What's he mainly praying for? That you may be perfect or grow in maturity and be filled completely with the word of God and the will of God. This is, a, this is a great man. You'll see the position he holds in this church. He was very, thus evidently with him at Rome when he wrote to the Colossians. He was a distinguished disciple. He was the, found, the founder and the pastor at the Colossian church. So we're looking at the pastor, the preacher. He wasn't always in the pulpit. He wasn't always there. And as we'll get to see, these men would travel nearby from church to other churches just to help, to encourage, to be a blessing. So in some ways, they might have been circuit riders, but this was his home church. He's mentioned in Philemon, where he is also called a fellow prisoner. He, def he was a soul winner in Laodicea and Hierapolis, went over to help those churches. He won souls there. And so as you see Colossae on the map and you see Hierapolis nearby and Laodicea, it was nothing to go visit those two cities and those two churches. The prayer life of Epaphras is very interesting, and I've delineated it for you and alternated in the colors. But we've taken scripture of what we know about Epaphras and his prayer life because he was big on prayer. He was the preacher. He prayed continually, we know it by the word always. He prayed intensely, laboring fervently with passion, he prayed. He prayed personally for you. He pr prayed purposefully in this verse, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. We just read that verse. He prayed zealously. He has a great zeal for you. And he prayed inclusively for them in Laodicea and Hierapolis. He just didn't, he just wasn't concerned about his church. He prayed for the church family, the churches, prayed for the people in them. He cared. He had a burden for them. That God would bless them and lift them and use them. For I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. What a testimony. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Well, we know Luke was the doctor who accompanied Paul on the, his missionary journey. He's the writer of also the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Demas uh, was a co-worker that we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, for, for he forsook forsook Paul, and Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, is how that verse goes. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos, and the church which is in his house. And so in, in Laodicea, the church was in Nymphos, one of the members' homes, as it was in Colossae, 
probably in Philemon's. And when the epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And so you see, they, they would flip these. The epistle from Laodicea was probably the Ephesians letter. These could be circular letters, meaning they pass them around because they wanted to hear what one Paul had to say, but also what he was saying about the word of God. They were learning God's word. They were learning about God, about what God stood for and, and how to pray. They were learning practical as, felt, as well as theological things when they, in doing that. And say to Archippus, Take heed or keep an eye on the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you fulfill it. Uh, Archippus was a Colossian believer who took over the pastorate or the pulpit when Epaphras was imprisoned or not there. And so he says, you keep, you guard it. You keep an eye on it. And the concluding verse is the, sal the salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. Remember that Paul was a prisoner when he wrote the book. Grace be with you. Amen. Well, we started off with grace to grace. Do you remember that? Right off of Paul talks about we, we open the book with grace and we end it with grace. And everything in between is the grace of God and the, great, the blessings of grace that he has bestowed upon us. So here's four words for prayer warriors today. You pick them up, but they're all throughout the Bible. Be sober. Pay attention. Be alert. See, know that the, our, the, the Satan is creeping about as a roaring lion. Be alert and attentive to that. Be at leisure, a peace of mind. Pray with a right heart with peace of mind as you pray. Be waiting. Expect God to answer. And also be agonizing. Make it a matter of life or death in your Christian life. I want to thank you for uh, listening in, for being a student. Uh, these lessons were taught live to a, an actual prayer meeting class and consecutive Wednesday nights. And it has been honor, an honor to be able to do that. And if you need to know some of my references, some pretty great people here and great resources. Father, thank you for this book and what it's said to us and spoken to our hearts and our lives. Drive it home to us. Make us better Christians because of the example of Paul, Epaphras, Philemon, Archippus, the many other men that had to, that that had leadership positions in this work. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Thank you and may God bless you.